Hey, hello, it's Leela Viss. I hope that some of you can join me this morning, and if not, you'll be able to find this video at here on uh, my page, pianokeys.me, and also I will post it in my Facebook group called Piano Pedagogy on and off the bench. So thank you for those who join me. And I wanted to follow up on a blog that was written by Doug Hanvey last week. It was posted at 88pmkeys.me and it just laid out the foundation for a rock solid technique, technique for our students and for ourselves. And I wanted to elaborate on a couple of things that Doug talked about. And it, the problem with technique is there's so much involved with it as far as visual and physical um, elements are concerned. So I decided that I wanted to do a live video and give you some tips on how I like to teach technique. Now, I just want to make a disclaimer that I have learned these through the years because I have seen my own students struggle with technique and also myself. I, I didn't grow up with a really strong technical basis and I've learned from a lot of good people and how to build a better technique. And I, I just want to share some of those tips with you. So first of all, I'm just going to go through Doug's blog and uh, highlight something about each one of his points. The very first thing he talked about was sitting height. And I think this is always just a little bit tricky because, you know, the piano is this beast and we just have to make ourselves fit within it. And with little kiddos, it's just not going to be so easy. So I really do like my students to have their feet on the floor. I know you can't see uh, my feet, but I like them to have their feet on the floor, which means they might be kind of perched, you know, right at the edge of the bench. Now, you can also get, you know, the nice little footstools. I've, I've used those in the past. I feel like my students mess with them all the time with their feet, and it can be just a little frustrating because um, it's just one more thing for them to play with. Uh, but the, the sitting height is really important. You don't want them too low. You don't want them too high. You want them so that the arm is parallel, and I think he talks about that. And then how far do you sit? I think you've probably seen this before. I think I learned it from Randall Faber's books where you use this little pose, and um, this should be a straight line from the fall board to your shoulder. And my students use that all the time, and they can find that placement immediately. So that's just a little tip. It's, again, a concrete tip that students can remember right away. Uh, then the, the next thing he talks about is posture. You know, what does that posture look like? And we all struggle with that because we are all sitting like this all day long, most likely at our computers or writing down things. And we have to get our shoulders back and down. So I'll have my students do this quite often. I've even uh, had them venture into some other yoga positions just for fun, especially in a group, it's just a little bit more fun, but it helps them become more aware of where every part of their body is and if they're aligned or if they're humping, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is, okay, I've got this crazy little thing by my piano and everyone kind of like get this out and they get all kind of scared, but then it's just for fun, but it just kind of reminds them, of, okay, your back should be straight. And um, especially if they they seem to play like this, I get this out and then we put it against their back. I don't pinch them. It just uh, they think it's funny, um, but that can help. Any any kind of straight item to help them align themselves just a little bit more. The other thing is, uh, a lot of students and us included, when we're working hard, our shoulders tend to creep up, and they like to eat our ears. Is what I say. So you know, I'll just tap their shoulders, remind oop shoulders down, and then oh suddenly they remember that's right. And speaking of which. The shoulders down idea really has to come from standing up. So you're not going to be able to see me, but when I stand up, then my shoulders can hang right, I'm sorry, my arms hang right from my shoulders. And I want them to feel that. So rolling their shoulders and letting their arms fall to their sides. Really important for them to realize uh, that their arms, you know, and come from their shoulders. And it's not just from the elbow, it's not just from the wrist, it's not just from the fingers, but from the shoulder. Uh, and one thing that I like to do, if I'm having students uh, that just are really tense, I may just have them swing their arm from their shoulder like this, and then fall it, uh, 
fall right onto a piano key. So swing and then land like that. Doesn't sound so pretty, but I just want them to feel like if the piano wasn't there, their arm would just fall off. And that's a good way for them to start feeling what we like to call arm weight. And let's see, I think I forgot to get one. Oh, yes. Speaking of arm weight, one of the things that I love to do is get out a sock. This is a clean sock. This shows me so much information about a student. Because when I do this, I've made a little sling. Now, of course, I have my own, own arm in it, but I will have a student place their arm in that sock like that. And once they do that, I can feel right away uh, how much tension they are holding in that arm. Because I can tell immediately when they're kind of holding it up like this, they're not giving me all their weight. I'll say, give me all your weight. And they probably still won't do it right away. So then I'll have them hold the sock and I'll put my arm in it. And then I'll let them feel the weight of my arm. And then when I let go of the sock, my arm falls. Most of the time when your students do this little test, their arm will stay up like that, which means that they're not um, experiencing the weight of their arm and they're not feeling that gravity. So kind of jumped ahead just a little bit on that, but that's probably one of the, the biggest problems, the biggest hurdles for us to, um, you know, work with our students is feeling the arm weight. And they are not going to feel that arm weight if they're not aware of what their body is doing. So therefore, going back to the yoga, oh, the shoulders up and down, swinging their arms, just letting them do this kind of motion. And um, then there's so many good things about that, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So if I'm going down Doug's list, uh, we talked about posture and then alignment and swinging your arms onto the key. The next thing is the wrist. And really what happens is we want this arm to be level. So we want this all to be level. And when we go and play, it's really easy for that wrist to start sagging. And that's when I pull out one of these little rubber snakes and I put it right there. And I say, you gotta keep your wrist out of the snake pit. And then they know exactly what I mean by, oh, okay, the snake pit. And you know, they want to play like this. This is not a healthy position. So we want to get them out of that as soon as possible. So just having them be aware of that snake pick down below will help them adjust and keep this um, from sagging more. And then the wrist is also just a really important mechanism with this whole arm. I compare it to the knees. You know, when you jump up and down, you don't just jump with straight knees. You will jump with your knee. I'll have my students, I won't do it now, but I'll have my students jump and they'll notice they bend their knees. Same thing with the wrist. The wrist kind of bends to take the blow off of the whole entire arm. But sometimes they don't know what kind of movements I'm talking about with the wrist because they haven't moved like that before. Maybe they've done some painting. I'll get out a paintbrush and they can paint the wall. But a lot of times that's even kind of foreign. They just haven't done this motion before. And I want them to get used to it while their fingers stay by the key. So here's some tips. First of all, uh, I take out a little eraser. I've got lots of fun little erasers. I'll just put the eraser on the top of the hand and I want the student to be able to dump the eraser off. This takes a little while for them to master, but they finally do get it. Um, and what's fun is then when accents come around, then the accented note needs to be lowered quickly and the eraser pops off. And then we have fun trying to find the eraser all over the studio because they have a great time trying to know, shoot baskets on the piano. But that's a great little tip for the, for any student that is having a hard time with moving that wrist up like that. It's just not something that they do in school every day. And uh, so it's we have to inform them on how to do that. Uh, the other thing is, I learned this from my colleague Chi Watan, is, oh, the wrist is saying hello to the piano. I'll, I'll also say, oh, show your watch off to the piano. Anything like that to get them used to that feeling. Uh, then, Let's see, did I, yes. Oh, the one other thing that Doug talked about in his blog was the fact that our wrist tends to roll our hands. And I've had students like that before where they just kind of roll over to the pinky and then their pinky gets kind of sore. So 
the one thing to think about is to keep your thumb and your pinky perched. And sometimes the ladybug, a lot of times the ladybug can come in handy. You probably have one of these. But I say, you know, just keep that cage open and make sure that ladybug stays there and it doesn't smash the ladybug. Um, and that will help that hand from turning over. Another thing that I will do, I like to use this for scales too, is I've got a little golden coin. I think I stole this from another teacher. Well, sorry, I don't steal things, but I just really like things, so then I want to use them. But if a student's hand is turning quite a bit, you might want to just keep that coin right on top, just so that they're aware of when they start twisting and when it, it, it um, you know, moves over to the pinky or moves over to the thumb too much. If, if the coin falls off, that's information right there. Again, it's these concrete tools that we as teachers need. We need these in our back pocket because it's tricky to teach a really good solid technique. It doesn't just come overnight. And I feel like it takes a lot of nagging. And I, and I say that in a positive way, but we, I gotta say it again and again and again. You know, if we were there with them 24-7 practicing, that would help, but they're gonna forget about these habits. So that's why as many things as we can offer them, um, the better. And let's see, moving right along, knuckle buckle. Oh my goodness, this is probably one of the hardest things for students to understand because they are working hard at the piano, right? So because they're working hard, that means that they feel like they need to push really hard, and then we get that knuckle buckle. So then I start talking about, now really these keys are pretty light, and you know, we've got this big arm behind our fingers to help us play those keys. We really don't have to push. We don't have to press. I also will do this. I'll stand up and say, okay, if I keep pressing, is it going to change anything? No, it's not. So I try and get the point across as, <laughs> with as many crazy visuals as possible. Uh, so now, back to the knuckle buckle. Here's the ingredient that you need to remember about teaching and, and avoiding knuckle buckle. If you see knuckle buckle, it means that they're pushing down on the key. It's That's the evidence that we need, and then we have to keep them from pushing down on the key. So how are we gonna do that? A lot of it has to do with, again, swinging and landing using gravity as our friend. Another thing is to ha have them think of that they're just tapping on the key. They are not pushing on the key. And sometimes I'll do that with a student. Can I have your arm, please? And then I'll say, okay, this is pushing, and I won't hurt them. But And then they feel the difference. And then they will do that on my arm as well. Just the word tapping can help. How about sinking into the key? Um, think of the key that you're putting the key to bed, which you are because you're lowering the key into the bed of the key. And when you go to sleep at night, you don't push your head hard on the pillow. You know, you just lay your head down and it, you just fall asleep. Same thing. Once the key is in the bed, it doesn't have to be pushed down anymore. Uh, so those are... Those are ways to start avoiding that knuckle buckle, but I've had it before where kids just want to push. They feel like they have to work hard at the, the piano, and so they want to push. So here are some ideas. Now, uh, clothespins are a great way to just monitor the knuckle buckle. And most kids, when they do this, that knuckle is going to buckle. I can hardly do it with my, my fingers anymore. But I, I try and do this with second and third fingers. Fourth and fifth get pretty hard. Um, and fifth, I'm not concerned about knuckle buckle. Usually my, the pinky is made of steel is what I say, and that can stay um, more straight. It doesn't have to be rounded. But to avoid knuckle buckle, this is a way to start showing them what it means to have a firm knuckle instead of a collapsed knuckle. Little clothespins do work as well. They break a little bit faster. Uh, but knuckle buckle, oh, another thing which I did bring with me is I have a little thing of silly putty. Just letting students, um, you know, gently push, oop, not push, just uh, lower their finger into that silly putty. It's firm, but it's not hard, and they're not trying to get to the bottom. They're just, you know, letting them sink into the silly putty. So there's um, there's some tips for that knuckle buckle. It's just not an easy thing for them to just get over right away. You have to really do some preventative care before it happens, but most likely it's going to happen. 
It just is going to happen. So you got to be ready with a whole bunch of tips in mind. Let me see. Um, I think that's what I wanted to talk about with that. The, the one thing to think about again with that arm is they're going to land on a firm mm. finger. So that worm, that word firm, that can be a little bit troubling to them. It's confusing. Okay, is this, you know, going to be a firm finger that pushes? No, it's firm, but it just stays there. It's like your finger has a nice little pipe cleaner in the middle, but it's fuzzy on the outside. Anything that will help. Then, uh, let's see. Avoid stretching. Doug talks about that, too. And, you know, five-finger patterns. I'm a big, huge fan of five-finger patterns. <laughs> And it's easy beneath my hand because I've got big fingers, big hands. But with little fingers, it's going to be hard. So what I want to make sure that my students do is if they are going to play a five-finger pattern, first of all, they're going to get used to using fingers two, three, and four, the middle notes, and then the shells or the outsides of the notes. Now, when they're going to play all five notes in a row, I will not ask them to play it legato. That is just not a concern of mine right now because I want them to feel the arm behind each finger. Now, if they're not feeling that arm weight, that's when I like to bring out a little friend. Uh, my boys were big into amphibians and big into Beanie Babies, and luckily I kept a few. And Panama, that's Panama right there. Panama can help the students feel the weight of the arm lower the key. And it's magic. It really does work. And then they take it off and they remember how that feels. If you don't have a Panama or you've got adult students, you can always just rest one arm over the other so that they feel that arm weight. Uh, so there's, there's a couple of ideas there for you for the whole knuckle buckle situation, which it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. you got to be ready for that. And I've got a lot of kids that have these knuckles that, you know, uh, I don't know. They go way in. They're a double jointed almost. I got the sun coming in right now. If you haven't noticed, uh, then oh, one other thing about stretching the hand before we move on. If you're some of your you know older students are going to have to stretch their hand, and maybe that octave's not going to feel all that good. I I tell them that their hand is like a rubber band. It's gonna it's gonna open and then it's gonna close. It'll come back to its resting position. And how do you know what your resting position is? Have them stand up, and you'll see it on the side right there, Oops, backwards right there. And there's that resting position. You want to bring that right there onto the piano. Uh, then, oh, one other thing. Thumbs like to move around just a little bit, and then things turn, all that kind of stuff. The elbow goes out. So re remind them that the thumb does not like to go on vacation. The thumb likes to stay home. Uh, so that's a good reminder right there. Then what else does he talk about? Uh, oh, feet on the floor. I started talking about this at the beginning of the video. I really like feet on the floor. And what I like to say is that you are a tree and you are rooted to the ground. And once you're gonna move over to one side of the keyboard or the other, you're going to lean. And of course, a lot of people like to scooch over. So that's when I have, I don't know, I got this a long time ago. It's a big old close name. And it does some really cool squeaking noises. So I just do that, and it reminds them that I have now super glued them to the bench, and they must lean over and keep their feet firmly on the floor. If their feet aren't firmly on the floor, they're going to be just falling over. So that's the key to staying um, in the middle of the piano, have them glued there, and let them lean and feel the weight of their body help them play the notes that are high or low on the piano. Uh, now, all of these tips and a lot more I've collected in uh, a, a little PDF called Technical Difficulties Made Easier. And if you sign up for my newsletter, I'm going to be offering this free in my newsletter, which will come out tomorrow. And if you haven't signed up for it, you can go to my blog, 88pianokeys.me, and you'll see the little pop-up come up. Just sign up for that, and then this will be free. I'll also offer it in my store afterwards, uh, and you can purchase it there. But uh, tomorrow, in my newsletter, this will be free. So you might want to sign up just so you can find that. Uh, a couple other things. I just uh, released with my friend Andrea 
uh, who does wonderful graphic designs, she made a really cool game called Inspector Wiz. And it's, it's cards, and it feels just like a deck of cards, and it reviews the grand staff. But I think what you're going to like about the instructions is that th there's not just one game to play with this deck of cards, this Inspector Wiz cards. We've got 10 different games that you can play with this one deck of cards and you're going to like them because you can use them with students immediately even if they don't know how to read from the grand staff yet um, so i think you'll you'll be interested in in seeing what we have to offer and yes you're probably thinking oh i've got a million flashcards i don't need more or i like to use apps instead i kind of felt that same way until i started uh, doing some more sight reading drills with my own students and i just wanted some cards to play some games with and I really like the size of these and they've got a um, cute little magnifying glass on the top. She does such great artwork. So look for those at, at the site as well. They're on sale this week and I don't see anybody with questions right now but I thank you for watching those who are here. I think Stephen Hughes is there. Thanks Stephen and um, let me know if this was helpful. And I'd love to hear some of your tips to avoid knuckle buckle and pushing on the keys and all those kind of things. I think technique is something that we tend to overlook and maybe it's because we're a little bit timid about how to teach it and what does good technique look like. And I really don't think it needs to be that hard. It needs to be a natural feeling. And if it's not natural, then that's, that's when we need to change things. So starting from a natural foundation, like what Doug has laid out in his blog, I think um, is really helpful. So, um, oh good, thank you Jody, for letting me know. I'm glad that that was helpful. And Nice to see you, Sandra, and thanks again for joining me. And this, again, will be at, on my page, but I also, also will move it to my Facebook group called Piano Pedagogy On and Off the Bench. And I'd love to have you join us there. I, I try and make a, a community of ideas. Uh, I want to share my tips, but I'd also love to hear from you. I'd also like to know what you want to know more of uh, so we can do more Facebook Live videos. And so please keep in touch there. And good to see you. Have a good rest of your week. And again, look for my newsletter to come out tomorrow with a free PDF of all these technical difficulty tips. And um, if you're not signed up, please just go to 88 and you can sign yourself up. All right, take care. Bye.